Welcome to the Register's Report. My name is John Buckley. I'm the Register of Deeds for Plymouth County. This show is about Plymouth County real estate. Our headline for the month was Sales in Mortgages Up in September. This show is being taped in October. We're reporting on the September recordings at the Registry of Deeds. I have a great guest coming in the second segment of the show, Eileen Kane of William Ravis Real Estate and Kane Realty Group talking about our current real estate market. Um, we're going to talk a little bit of our county history uh, in the third segment. So let's go right to the numbers. Uh, let's go right to sales of property. Uh, there were 887 deeds recorded in September, less than the 1158 in August, slightly more than the 880 last September. We're still down slightly 6% for the first nine months in 2019. Uh, I'm going to show you an image of sales for Plymouth County um, for the month of September, actually January through September. Uh, Plymouth and Brockton have the highest number of sales in the county, though every community has had real estate activity. It's still a strong sales market, as you'll hear from our guest. Uh, the biggest jump has been mortgages with rates so low, people are refinancing. So we had a very large number of mortgages recorded, 2,302 mortgages recorded in September, more than the 2,240 in August, up 49% compared to the 1,542 mortgages in September of last year. For the first nine months of the year, it were 10% higher than last year. We always talk about foreclosures, particularly since the meltdown in 2008, and it's certainly been a good story on foreclosures, way lower than in the past. Only 33 foreclosure deeds across the county in September, about the same as in August, 25% less than last September, and for the first nine months of the year, foreclosure deeds are down 44%. A foreclosure deed is when a lender has taken back property, usually for non-payment. We also track foreclosure notices. A notice is when someone's facing difficulty. You can see that foreclosure notice number also is very low. And you'll see a listing of foreclosures in orders of notice for all the towns in Plymouth County. Um, be, be aware that we're having a new training session, free opportunity to search our land records efficiently. The next one is Thursday, November 7th at 9 a.m. Please call in advance um, to register. I have a great guest in the second segment, Eileen Kane of William Ravis Real Estate and Kane Realty Group discussing the current real estate market. Thank you. When some people struggle with their mortgage payments, they become frozen, petrified. Not knowing what to do, they do nothing. But the people who take action are far more likely to get the most positive outcome. Making Home Affordable is a free government program. Call now to talk one-on-one -on -one with a housing expert about the options that are right for you. Real help, real answers, right now. Welcome back to the Registers Report. My name is John Buckley. I'm the Register of Deeds of Plymouth County. In this segment of the show, we always do something educational in nature. We've had many people involved with real estate, title examiners, assessors, appraisers, and uh, the main people we have as guests because they're at the heart of the real estate community are realtors. I have a great realtor with me here today who's been a guest before, Eileen Kane. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, John. Appreciate you having me back. Eileen Kane of William Ravis Real Estate and Kane Realty Group. Yes. So first of all, why don't you tell our viewers a little bit of how you got into the real estate business? So I got into the real estate business in 2004. Um, if anybody can remember, it was the height, a nice height of the market. And it was a great time to jump in and, and do a career change. Uh, prior to that, I, was, um, I did legal recruiting in Boston. Um, prior to that, graduated from Northeastern. So it felt like a, a good thing to do, and it was, um, and still is. Good. Yeah. And I know you've been um, in a pretty wide 
a geographical area that you work in? Yes, yes. I've sold actually in 38 cities and towns. Wow, <laughs> that's pretty good. Yeah. More than 10% of the Commonwealth. You can do it, yeah. Wow, that's great. So talk a little bit about where you are now, where you work out of, and you know, um, sure. where your office is, and et cetera. So I work for William Ravis Real Estate. It's a family-owned business. It's been in business for over 40 years. Um, we have 41 Massachusetts offices, which I'm able to utilize a number of those. Sure. Uh, my home base basically is Brookline, but I will often travel into the Norwell office as well, and that's what allows me to sell in multiple, multiple towns. Great. So how has it been over the summer till now? Hot. Yeah. Hot. Probably one of the busiest summers that we've had in a long time. Um, there was never that slowdown that you typically get in August. Um, again, due to the interest rates being so welcoming mm -hmm. and inventory continuing to be, you know, low. Mm -hmm. So sellers are coming on. They want to capitalize on what we have here today. Great. So uh, let's talk a little bit about um, how people find you. Do you want to share your contact information? Sure. Um, you can find me on our William Ravis site, um, uh, which is www.ravis.com. You can find me also on Facebook. LinkedIn and Instagram under the Kane Group. Uh, Facebook is Eileen Kane, William Ravis Real Estate, and I'd be happy to share my cell, sure. which is 508-254-6865. So let's talk about where we are in the market right now. Mm -hmm. um, we, as I reported earlier in this show, have been having some pretty good numbers with sales, and obviously a huge refinancing market because of the rates, which is something that was pretty stagnant for a long time. So, you know, it's, it's an overall hot market. Yeah. Um, so what would your advice to be, be to someone out there looking as a potential seller? Let's start on that side. So if somebody has interest in selling, what yes. would the advice to be? Yeah. So again, it's, you know, with the inventory low, um, it still requires more than sticking a sign in your yard. You know, you still want to make sure that your market is, um, that your home is in pristine condition. Um, we look for, as real estate agents, what could come up in a home inspection. We really go in as inspectors, um, not just for the sale. Um, so we can better advise people. Professional photography, you know, whatever it takes, you still want to invest a lot into any particular sale, even though um, it's such a robust seller's market in order to get that real premium number that you can get. So, um, yeah, so my advice would be, you know, sometimes it's a simple thing as a, a change of coat of paint, you know, to make it warm and inviting, which some homes require staging, mm -hmm. you know, and some homes require some really good renovation to get what they want. It depends on the seller and their affordability and their desire. So I know that uh, setting the right price for a sale is very important. Yeah. How do you go about that? Yeah. So this, you know, strategically, what, what I tell a seller is you can never underprice a home, but you can still overprice a home. Buyers are pumping their brakes. You know, we've had an increase for years. And what we're seeing is although the sales are still happening, buyers are pumping their brakes a little bit um, for a number of reasons, you know, for, for what may be coming up ahead or not. Um, and just they maybe have had enough. So our strategy that, that myself and my team member Dominic use is price it right, bring the people in, and let us look at multiple offers versus hanging up too high where the fish can't get you, right? And then you're sitting out there. The average days in the market are so low that if you've got a property in the market for a couple of months, people go, what's wrong? Mm -hmm. Something has to be wrong. Mm -hmm. And we don't want that. It can cost you thousands. So let's flip, flip it over and talk about someone that would be a potential buyer, mm -hmm. what would your advice be to them? Because of the interest rates, it's still the great time to buy. I don't think we've ever really had in the history of real estate that I can remember where it's so great for both. Right. It's cheaper to own a home than to rent right now. The rental market is very high and investors are getting a lot of money for their properties. So at three and a half percent, I just locked a VA in at 325 percent on a 30-year fix, right. no money down, wow. closing costs paid for, wow. um, why wait? Mm -hmm. You know, although you may have to take a bit to find your right home, um, and I suggest that they still do, um, you know, take a bit to do that, it's 
cheaper to own than to rent. So if you have the ability to do such a thing, do it. Don't hesitate. Mm -hmm. The interest rates, there's only one place for them to go, John, and that's up. So I know most buyers are coming in, if not all buyers are coming in pre-approved. Mm -hmm. You have to. I mean, yeah. you have to come in ready. If you have any interest or thoughts of buying a home, the first thing is if you're a cash-based buyer, have all your, you know, have that available, your proof of funds. If you're going to be financing, you better sit with the lender. Let them prepare you as to make sure that you're getting the best terms. Sometimes it may take a little bit. They mm -hmm. may discover something on a credit report they didn't know existed. Right. So, you know, again, just prep yourself because that dream home is going to come up mm -hmm. and you want to be able to pull the trigger on it. So I know there's been a real trend in buyer education. Yeah. Have you um, had much experience with that? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of lenders out there will hold classes, mm -hmm. you know, for that. We ourselves will educate the buyers before making an offer. Um, you know, in the city, closer to the city, um, they just want the house, you know, and, and again, they'll bid over. Um, but, you know, is how we can educate as well is if you're not, if you're going to sleep well at the end of the day, because even learning that this house is not yours, mm -hmm. then wait. If you can live without it, then wait. Wait the 30 days. If the seller's still sitting out there, you could get your price, mm -hmm. right? So, but again, you have to be able to live with that. If you are going to be so upset that you lost the house over $5,000, then pay the $5,000. Because mm -hmm. over the 30 years, you're never going to remember that, right? You're only going to remember the memories that you spent in that home. Yeah, I know, I, I'm very aware that since the meltdown in 2008, mm. which we all remember, um, there's been a lot more focus on these buyer education courses. Yeah. Some lenders now require it. Yeah. You know, mass housing and others require it. Yeah. And I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing that people go in with their eyes wide open. Yeah, what happened in 2008, you know, was horrendous for for really for sellers too right mm -hmm. so right. again they pulled equity out of the house because the price increased and there was no real sign of, of what you know happened um, so I think buyers and sellers are, are real more much more cautious mm -hmm. and um, getting the education on their own as well you know mm -hmm. which is good so let's talk about one of my favorite subjects first-time home buyers how mm -hmm. difficult it is to get people into the marketplace What's your experience been with that, and what kind of recommendations would you make for anyone watching the show that's thinking about entering the purchase market for the first time? Yeah. So share with me if you could just define your what you had just said. It's difficult, and how so? Well, I think with um, prices being high, mm -hmm. uh, many people having student loans outstanding, right. and uh, fear that they don't have the down payment. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of hesitation and people are not sure where they want to live right. and prefer uh, renting longer than I believe people would have done in the past. Yeah, yeah. So all that is, you know, thank you for, you know, clearing that up for me. So, you know, with the, as, here's how I operate as a real estate agent. I need them to know their numbers. Mm -hmm. And I always say, know your numbers. You never want to go over, you know, 40% of your net income. So I may over-educate and lose a sale, but I'd rather do that than sell the house short sale possibly three years from now. Mm -hmm. So again, it's preparing. Um, there are a lot of programs, first-time home burgers, where you don't need money down. Mm -hmm. And interest rates at 3.5%, not free, but pretty close to it, right? So it's okay to, to mortgage most of that. Mm -hmm. When the interest rates are up in the 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, you know, 18, you wanted less of a mortgage. You wanted that money down. Mm -hmm. um, so again, it's you know between the real estate agent educating them, them knowing their numbers, projection security of employment, and you know not overpaying, mm -hmm. not as far as the sale price, overpaying as far as their own affordability. Let's get real. I know you want that seven hundred thousand dollar house, but do you need it? Right? Do you need it? So really having those conversations super important to the first home buyers. But I just closed a, a deal for a first home buyer who was one of my tenants and who now became my buyer. So I lost a tenant and got a buyer. You know, 
young, young couple, early, early 20s with wow. two small children. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and watching them, we, you know, I had the conversation with them very early in our relationship, um, working relationship of what to do, you know, how to build credit. They used to pay me with a little money order. I'm like, get a credit card, get a checkbook. Here's how you do it. And now their employment has, you know, really grown, and they're homeowners. So cl clearly the overall percentage of homeowner, homeowners have, has dropped since the 2008 meltdown. Um, why don't you tell our viewers... Um, and I will add that realtors, of which you're very much a realtor, not a real estate agent, you realtors are, are a special code of conduct and all of that. Yes. And you promote home ownership uh, in a serious way. Why is it important for people to look at home ownership rather than renting or continuing to rent? Oh, because you're building equity. Right. You know, um, the landlord has, has the opportunity for the equity, the long-term reward. And, you know, they'll hold properties through the, through the high, through the low, um, and be able to get that tax benefit and all that. So for, you know, for a renter, there's some, I guess, small tax benefit, but very little. And again, you're not building equity, you're building equity for somebody else. Mm -hmm. So um, let's, let's talk a, a little bit about the changes in real estate. We talked a little bit, you have one of your apprentices here, yeah. who's gonna come on the show in the near future, yeah. Dominic yeah. Lachance. Who's yes taking notes over there and seeing how this all works. Uh, we talked a little bit about the change in technology in the mm -hmm. real estate community, both in terms of how realtors operate and how many people, uh, when they come in as potential buyers, have seen a lot of which is out there. How much have you seen over your time change that way? So years ago, the old school real estate way was face to face, which still is, but a buyer knows everything about you before they ever meet you. They're online. So if a real estate agent doesn't have re online exposure, mm -hmm. you're not getting picked, right? So there's so many avenues for people to get to know you before they choose you. So that can be good and bad, you know? It's good for the person that can keep up with it. And for the real estate agents that can't, it can be tough. You're looking at your old relationships, keeping that rapport, mm -hmm. but you're limiting your ability to do a lot of business. Mm -hmm. So with somebody like Dominic, who's 21, um, been with me now for a couple of years. Um, he grew up with the technology. He lives the technology. So for a dinosaur like me, you know, it's just without him, you know, it, it would be it would be more difficult, you know. But the technology, even within the realtors, to other realtors and attorneys, all yeah. the information going back and forth in seconds compared Lead to, to speed. the days when. Right. Everyone had to do hand-signed ink documents. You were in your car. You were driving to get an offer signed. You were, you know, that's that's no longer. Everything is digi signed, docu signed. Most companies have it. I can't imagine any company that doesn't right. have that ability to to do such a thing. So it makes it for um, smoother transaction, um, less having to, you know, more. It gives you more time mm -hmm. and the ability to, you know, to work uh, smarter, mm -hmm. not harder. So let's um, look as we go through the fall, where this show is being taped in middle of uh, October. Yeah. We're gonna come through a couple months. The weather's been incredible uh, for us this year. Right, yep. Uh, what do you see coming through the rest of the fall to the holidays? We're still seeing homes come on the market. Yep. We're still listing homes. Um, Dominic set four appointments today, this morning, um, helping for sale by owners. Um, Ultimately, he's going to list their homes. So right. um, I don't see a slowdown because, you know, everything is just, again, interest rates. Everything's stable. Mm -hmm. Everything is stable. And people want to cash, you know, out too. I'm looking at the five-year market trend, which I pulled for our meeting today. And all the indicators say, if you have any thoughts of selling your home, now is the time. You know, we don't have a crystal ball, but we do know the history of real estate and how it works. And we're just starting to see a stabling, and, mm -hmm. and in some towns, a little bit of a adjustments, mm -hmm. seeing some price changes every day. Mm -hmm. So the fall will be strong. It'll be fall strong all the way into you know spring of next year, and then we'll see. And so it's impossible to tell where we're going by listening to economists, because they're all over the lot, up and down. You know, recession, no recession, drop in housing, you know, 
Uh, although I will say this time, it doesn't look like housing is going to be the issue like it was in 2008. Yeah. In, in 2008, all those um, you know mortgage issues that that popped up, people that were um, no income, no, doc no documentation, yeah. loans have gone away. They've yeah. been forced out by the federal government. So we're less likely to see any problems with that. Although there are possibilities um, to continue another couple of years on a good market. It's always cyclical. What do you see cyclical. as we go into 2020? We're heading into our 10th more over the over 10 years right. of that growth, right? right? Already, which is over. Right. Um, but again, we watch our market. But it is important to know what's going on in other countries as well, mm -hmm. um, just to, to, to keep an eye on it. And it's a little bit of an indicator. Connecticut's had some really big adjustments so far as well. But we want to follow the inventory. The inventory is the key, right? The more inventory there is, the more um, competition for sellers, mm -hmm. which will bring prices down, mm -hmm. down, down. Um, there'll be less buyers and more sellers. So when that switch starts to happen, and we, wa we watch it all, that, that's part of our business intelligence as a real tour, is to be able to convey and educate the sellers to what you see today. We don't really know what's gonna, I mean, we can have an indication of what's gonna happen over six months, but two or three years? It depends, it depends on the interest rate and the inventory. I'm getting an indication that our time has flown oh, by very wow, quickly, as, really? it, as, as it always does. That's so it. can you share your contact information one more time? I will, viewers? yes, thank you. It is, uh, my name is Eileen Kane with William Ravis Real Estate, um, the Kane Group at ravis.com, 508-254-6865. Um, and you can find me on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. And I thank you for watching the show with me. Right. Thank Thanks you. for coming Thank on, you for yeah. having me. I right. appreciate it. It's always good. See you. Hope you have a good rest of the fall. Thank you. You as well. This is why you get by on four hours sleep. Why you took a second job. This is why you taught yourself how to fix the plumbing and spend hours juggling the bills. This is why you'll do whatever it takes to keep your home. And that is why we want to help. We are making home affordable, a free government resource that can make paying the mortgage easier. Now more options are available. Call 888-995-HOPE to talk one-on-one -on -one with a housing expert today. So I'm John Buckley, the Registrar of Deeds of Plymouth County. Welcome back to our show. Eileen Kane did a great job in talking about the current real estate market and what we can expect in the future and some tips for buyers and sellers. In this segment of the show, we do something a little lighter in nature, some of our great history. Um, October is National Breast Cancer Awareness Month. The 8th of October is Young Kipper. The 14th was Columbus Day. The 28th, National Chocolate Day. And on the 31st, Halloween. We're going to show some of our notable land records. Um, first is Mickey Cochran. He was the only person from Plymouth County elected into Baseball's Hall of Fame. He was born in Bridgewater. He went to Boston University to college. He led it in five sports, baseball, football, basketball, hockey, and boxing. He's known as the greatest catcher of the era. He played and managed baseball for 13 years with the Philadelphia Athletics and the D Detroit Tigers. Uh, won five pennants, three World Series, and two American League Most Valuable Player Awards. We're coming to the end of the baseball season. We're right now in the middle of the pre um, uh, predecessor to the World Series, the American and National League uh, final um, competition. And uh, think of Mickey Cochran and all he went through during his era uh, for baseball at the time. The next you're going to see is another uh, one of our notable records. It's in celebration of Columbus Day, 
the Giuseppe Garibaldi Club in Plymouth. It was named for the famous Italian patriot who led the unification of Italy. North Plymouth was the home to many Italian immigrants. They worked in joint social clubs. The Garibaldi Club was established in 1933 as an Italian social club. It was relocated to Castle Street in 1948, and it was named in honor of Giuseppe Garibaldi, a patriot military leader whose exploits led to the freedom of Italy from foreign rule. And his bravery has been recognized worldwide, statues in Rome, New York City, and squares around the world. Next, you're going to see a notable record, Pope's Tavern. It is currently the Halifax Council on Aging, but it originally was a tavern in the center of Plymouth County, directly across the street from Halifax Town Hall. Many famous visitors came to the tavern, among which was Daniel Webster. But in October of 1830, they had a Republican congressional convention held at Pope's Tavern when John Quincy Adams, who had been formerly the president of the United States, uh, was nominated to re represent that district in Congress. Um, he had previously lost his president's seat at Andrew Jackson. He's the only United States president to go on and later serve in Congress. Uh, Halifax is the heart of Plymouth County. Pope's Tavern um, was a very well-known place. Um, next, you're going to see an image from our colonial records. We're coming very close to the original um, celebration of the arrival of the Mayflower. Every month, we show one of our uh, colonial records. In this particular case, it was how they handled colonial affairs in the 17th century. When a man, Mr. Hopkins, was fined for selling a looking glass for a, a great profit um, in uh, bought it at a certain price, sold it for much higher. And at the time in colonial affairs, that was looked at on as usury and fined for that. And a few other examples of individuals um, that were buying things for a low price and selling them for a higher price were fined because the colony government didn't like that. It's certainly something we celebrate now uh, when people can make a profit and run a business that way. But Back in the 17th century, it was looked upon as taking advantage of people. So I want to thank Lona Green Baker, Christine Richards from my office, helping me put this show together. I, I want to thank Mike Simmons for working with me on this show, and bro thank Brock and Cable Access for doing what is my 109th show. And I know that it pales in comparison with a couple other shows, like Steve Demos's Demos uh, Greek Melodies, in the Cape Verdean show of the Ernestina. Um, but we do this every month, telling you about uh, from what most people is their most valuable asset, and we'll see you next month. So I have a happy and safe Halloween, and we'll see you in November. <laughs>